cover. Might as well jump right in. I want to start on this page. Nope, on this page. Cool. What's up, everybody? My name is Richard Terrell, and you are watching Dio Live, a daily stream show in which we talk about game design. And today's topic, oops, hey, my game just popped up on the stream. But today's topic, we're going to continue sort of with a randomly decided upon puzzle theme for this week. This week. And we've um, been thinking about puzzles all week. Uh, I've been playing some puzzles, and today I got really curious about jigsaw puzzles because jigsaw puzzles are my least favorite style of puzzle, but I kind of want to learn a little bit more about what they had to offer and what they were doing. Oops, don't do that. Okay, uh, so right now with the Enlighten, I'm going to pause that in the background, so we're going to go back here. Okay, so a lot of these conversations are just musings and interesting new ideas that popped up, and I posted about a few of them in the Discord, and we know, I know Tony had a few questions, and Zara had a few questions. Uh, I might as well pop the link to this in the chat. Nope. Uh, Twitch. Okay. So, let me see if I can scroll up a little bit. We're going to be talking about sort of the underlying elements of puzzles. Nothing too crazy, but um, let me show you something that kind of got my curiosity peaked. Where is it? So this this video first. You can just kind of check this out. Ooh. And it's not moving. Okay. Okay, there we go. So this is a video about different sorting algorithms, and it makes really weird sounds, so I'm going to reduce that volume greatly. Um, and the algorithms, this is a selection sort, and you can see it sort of happening in real time, which is really interesting, right? So you have a collection of different data points, in this case, all these different color bands, and no, no two bands are the, the same, and they're like pretty pixel thin. So what is it, 56,000 colors or something like that? It's just sorting through those. But they're showing you different sorting methods, like insertion sort. This is what this one is. You can kind of see how quickly they move and, and how efficient some of them are. Uh, and I just kind of watched a lot of these sorting algorithms um, play themselves out. And, you know, Brilliant.org has been spamming me with their, with their advertisements. But one thing that they had an advertisement of was sort of uh, explaining what a merge sort algorithm is and why it's much faster than just doing every single comparison <laughs> to, to create the sort. Um, and it got me thinking about data, it got me thinking about organization, it got me thinking about language and definitions, it got me thinking about skill and knowledge and complexity, and all these things kind of wrap themselves up very nicely into um, an interesting discussion about puzzle design. So I'll just leave that running in the background while we continue. Um, so with my own game, which I'll bring up, one of the things that I thought was really... I'll mute you too. Actually, the music might be nice. Here we go. We'll pause you and bring you up. So one thing that I was trying to illustrate in my own game, which I talked about yesterday and I talked about on a previous stream, and you can find out more details about that elsewhere, but um, I recognize that I even say it in one of the lectures, I don't know which one it is, but one of these lectures down here talks about all these requirements there are to learning something, and essentially learning something involves a lot of just storing the data in your head, but what people don't seem to realize is just storing that data is a much more sort of versatile, open-ended, and complex process than just like, you know, reading over a list over and over until you, you can't forget it, or memorizing it by brute force. Um, at any step in the learning process, you can apply your mind more intelligently and work smarter instead of harder. And that makes even some of the lower level rote uh, activities in learning, like memorizing things, also uh, highly skilled and highly reflective of your unique and individual intelligence. So with that in mind, I was making this game and I realized, okay, at some point when you're playing Enlightened, you know, these puzzles get more and more complex as you go out deeper and deeper rings, like seven clicks, eight clicks, nine clicks, ten clicks, right? More and more complex, and the, the further the puzzle goes out, the more likely there's going to be 
uh, connections that move off from it to show you kind of like how the puzzle branches with everything else and the more likely those branches happen the more and more branches would possibly happen to you have something like this so the game gets pretty complex pretty quick and um, in order to master this game in order to uh, solve a lot of these harder puzzles in order to progress you really have to organize data differently you really have to um, not only have observations and thoughts and ideas but you have to remember them and organize them and, re and review them so that's why as a general um, feature we I included this feature where you can take notes and it takes screenshots of the screen and with any of these screenshots you can play them back again and explore them like this yeah and solve it right so like you're never too far away from making a, a solid memory addition and because it's a computer it'll keep everything that you've memorized forever and because I added social features you can add the notes of your friends which are color-coded in different ways right you can see all these different notes here's some red uh, so it's just a really interesting way to get that process going but beyond that it's not just about taking notes and it's not just about reading notes you actually have to organize the information and run tests and basically make groups so one of the last features I made for this game was its ability to make a hashtag so these are all my hashtags Whenever you're making a note like this, you can just be like, I'm making a note. Wait a minute. Hashtag wait a minute. Then, you know, you keep typing and then wait a minute will be a hashtag from then on onward. Oops. Yeah. And then when you're playing, you can be like, hashtag bring together and it shows you the hashtags you created. It also shows you entries for puzzles that you can uh, include in your notes. So it's super organized. and. Um, and just like with Twitter, using hashtags as a way of recognizing patterns and forming groups. And I felt like that was super important for um, advanced learning. So I encourage players to make their own hashtags. And in this particular mode right here, you can click on your hashtags and you're supposed to give them a definition. And when you give them a definition, you can also include different um, puzzles that fit in that group, like asymmetric puzzles. Okay, definition is... These puzzles are do not look symmetrical, uh, either vertically or horizontally. Simple, simple definition. We we'll save it here. So now, when I'm defining asymmetric, uh, you can look at the the puzzles and you're like, "Huh, this one's asymmetric," and and it looks like this one's a little asymmetric, and. Uh, you can go through like that and help organize some of the things that you've uh, some of the, you organize some of the concepts and definitions you've defined for yourself. Uh, yeah, and I could add here like don't count diagonals symmetry. Okay, and that's something that I kind of realized right here, and you save it right. So I encourage people to make their own hashtags. I encourage them to. Um, keep track of things that they say and kind of use their own language as they go along. Like these are all these concepts that I thought were important and I just make them up as I go along. Just like with Twitter, you don't really worry too much about it. And then here you can compare some of your groups, right? Like what's the difference between asymmetric puzzles and and these these bring together style puzzles. So like interesting. The bring together includes this right here. Asymmetric includes this including the middle and this middle is the one that's shared between both of them. You're like, "Oh, there's very few puzzles so far that seem to be both asymmetric and bring together, right? Now that's just a, a cursory level observation, like I can make that note here and it includes the hashtags for me, which is fun. There seems to be very few notes that are both hat bring uh, both of these categories because it's already in their categories. Uh, keep that in mind. And you don't worry about it, right? This is just all this exercise and doing this mode in itself is a great boon to your learning and uh, skill building endeavors. So the note that I made, even if I never read it again, that actually, you know, stressed a curious thought in my mind. And I'm like, huh, is that is that true? Like every time I run to an asymmetric shape, I probably should figure out some non bring together strategy to, to solve it. And just to let you know, bring together is my hashtag right here. Some shapes have far away elements that are better if you bring them together. Uh, so let's look at this one. I'll show you what I mean. 
this is the uh, level editor, you can just make puzzles like that. So this is what I mean by bringing together, You're like, hmm, two dots are far away from each other, that's why I call it two dots, but let's just try bringing this dot over to the next dot. And like, hey, it turned out bringing them together is the way to solve it, and that's why I made that hashtag. Um, so yeah, I'm just thinking on the level of a much higher level than just solving an individual puzzle, just perfecting an individual puzzle, just playing an individual puzzle uh, blind without seeing it. This is a level where you're organizing things by concept and forming much bigger groups and making much higher level organization. And essentially what this step entails is sorting, right? You have some kind of criteria, some kind of definition, some kind of divisive defining um, rule. And then you go through your old memories and maybe some new examples. These are all the puzzles in the game, by the way. And you try to sort them into one group or the other. Like that's sorting. And what we saw with the video, sorting seems to be quite uh, an interesting challenge and task in itself. So I'm going to mute you. I'm going to go back to the, the sorting video. So if you imagine these to be just like every single one of these color bands to be uh, uh, something that you've learned or observed about whatever you're learning, right? And you notice that some colors work better when you put them next to each other and some don't. So the whole idea is, let me get a better idea. Let me get a better sense of what all this complexity means by organizing it, by sorting it. And uh, if you just left it in the unsorted state, it's just like a rainbow kaleidoscope and it's really hard to get a sense, right? Uh, and that's why sorting is really important. So do you get this higher level understanding once everything is just, just organized into a group and sitting side by side with each other right here? All right, super smooth. Uh, there's not much to say about a color wheel, so this is just like a metaphor or an example. But imagine if this was data points or puzzles and enlighten or anything else you're trying to learn. How you group it can tell you and teach you interesting new things. Uh, it raises your observation levels to the stage just beyond that group. Uh, so when looking at symmetrical puzzles and asymmetrical puzzles, once you group them, now you're thinking, on top of being asymmetrical, what can I observe? On top of being, uh, did I say symmetrical? Asymmetrical, <laughs> what can I observe? Uh, and then if you build on top of that, you're just, you're just going crazy, right? Like it's just how you, it's another effective way of thinking about things uh, on a higher level, having your thoughts take more into consideration with each observation instead of just sticking with low-level stuff. Um, so that that's a really curious thought I've been puzzling through uh, recently. And then I came across this video, which I'll show you here. So in my research, uh, looking for jigsaw, uh, looking up jigsaw puzzles, wow, the, these advertisements really just, so caliber, please. And I loaded that up before. So like this is a YouTube, YouTube channel where this, where Karen is solving puzzles, right? And she's talking about different techniques she uses. One of them right off the bat includes, what is it? Sorting the puzzles individually and making sure that all the pieces are face up. I thought that was kind of neat. She's like, you really want to be able to see what's important about the puzzles. And if it's face down, all you see is the shape, but if they're face up, you see the color. So she just goes ahead and separates all the edge pieces on the top, and then every other piece she puts in and tries to put the light colors together. This is sorting, right? Doesn't seem like a big deal, but as all the other pu Jigsaw Puzzle um, fans seem to suggest, the early s earlier you do sorting like this, the more it pays off in the end, right? So even though her sorting method right here isn't too um, strict, right? Some people get really bent out of shape about definitions and whether or not something fits in and out. Like it doesn't matter, at least initially. The point of, a, of a, having a definition and sorting things is to build mental structures and make other steps down the line easier, even if you have to come back and correct it. Like if she didn't put an end piece, uh, if she put an edge piece and forgot to include it on the top, she could easily sort that out later. It's not like it breaks her entire system because she made one mistake or she found out that one of her examples belongs in this category versus the other. So yeah, she goes through like that. She, you know, she organizes it. She takes all of her edge pieces and then she organizes it even further to where all the top edges of the edge pieces are lined with the top edges, right? <laughs> And unless it's a corner, every edge piece is only going to have one edge. So look, she separated the corners out to the side. I'm going to draw on the screen. 
right here. All the corner pieces are on the side and all the rest of the edge pieces are over here. That's even subdividing the subdivide, right? That's like three layers deep. All puzzles, edge, all right. Edge pieces and corner pieces are a subsection of edge pieces. So this even seems trivial. I think a lot of people don't realize that a lot of higher level things are more securely built, more accurate, more robustly sustained, if you will, when they're built out of these lower level, it's concrete, solid, easy to understand uh, factors, criteria, observations, whatever. And even though conceptually this is really easy to understand, what's not easy to understand is how many dividends, how much it pays you back in the long run, how much time it saves you, how it makes you think differently, how the very act of physically moving the pieces changes the way you think. Like it's, it cannot be overstated how important this is. So she organizes it like that, starts to make her edges right. This is a classic opening move for um, Jigsaw fans. And this is made easier because of the organization she has and the way that she can see colors and patterns and sideways pieces more effectively once she has done it. Then she just picks a color, which she's roughly organized out of the, the middle pieces, and she groups all of them together by color. So like, hmm, that makes it to where even if her small sample selection here doesn't include every piece she needs, it focuses her attention on just the thing that she needs to focus on, which is color, pattern, and shape. Like, and not all colors, just the subtle difference between a, a lemon yellow and a dark yellow, right? That's super important. Much harder to keep that focus when you're looking for basically all the colors in the universe. Much easier to keep the focus when you have a small subsection group like this. This is like a physical representation, a neat and elegant physical metaphor for how our brains work and how we learn, right? So then she goes through, picks out some reds, and let's see what she has to say overwhelming and you might not really know where to start, I find that you just pick a piece like this that has a very distinctive section in it. So I'm pretty sure that's going to be this piece. There we go. So now you pick another side and I think this piece goes there. And now you have two sides and so it's a lot easier to find a, the corner of a piece than it is just to find one side of it. So I'm pretty sure. That is also non-trivial, right? What she did was, in the face of sheer numerical complexity, right, she was like, okay, well, it is overwhelming. It is a lot to think of. It is kind of hard to know where to start. But what you do is you, you use your own observation engine to help further your progress. And if there's a piece that stands out to you, that means that however you've tuned your brain to um, observe the world, uh, whatever, when you look at a jigsaw piece, puzzle piece jumps out at you most, well that's clearly the result of like a much longer history of either observing things or playing jigsaw puzzles or whatever. So you should probably lean to that first because that's where your brain's firing the most sort of uh, neurons or whatever. In this case she found a piece that has three colors, red, maybe dark red, yellowish and blue. And she's like, well this piece is very unlike the others, so I'm going to start here and try and because that piece has so much complexity because it has four colors, she found another piece that has three colors and it's not going to be this, oh, I'm going to show you on the screen. It's not going to be this piece, two colors-ish, two colors. This piece kind of has three colors, but she found a piece that has blue, uh, light red, and dark red. And she found another piece that had a ton of red, right, uh, with a lot of dark red. So it just makes it just that much easier. Um, even doing something as simple as putting a jigsaw together, you can use a lot of smarter decisions, smarter methods, and not only you know physically organizing the pieces but you yourself are an important element in solving a puzzle so the better you know yourself your own quirks your own tendencies and the better you sort of design and make methods around yourself the better you're going to do this one that cannot be understated and then you just continue like that and honestly it just takes practice and doing a lot of puzzles to be able to visualize the piece that you need and then quickly spot it in the pieces that you have around you. You hear that? So again, she says it takes practice and uh, experience to see what you have going and visualize the kind of puzzle piece you need. So like everyone can kind of know like um, everyone knows that where is it? 
right here you need like a little a piece that sticks into it and of course there's a hole you need a piece there but those two holes are not the same um, they're shaped slightly differently right and the puzzles that connect to them I'll show you this one is kind of convex and this one's kind of concave like that like those are differences so again the specificity by which you have made observations and thus created your own sort of more detailed criteria will only pay more dividends down the line when you need to make individual um, or when you need to organize things by uh, that criteria so this isn't just color this piece isn't just color and shape it's not just how many you know pieces poke out and how many pieces uh, make holes in it it's also how the curvature of the all four sides work so that's like color is one one per side three four um, concave or convex two three four and then you know color can have up to like a, a handful of different things so this is one two one two three four five six seven eight nine so like every time she sees a puzzle she's probably thinking like nine different things at least that she's observing and every time an amateur sees a puzzle they just see like they may see binary does it fit or does it not does it fit or does it not and then because they can't visualize that they'll have to test it and when they test it it slows them down even further and the thing about testing is if you're not interacting with the uh, puzzle or whatever activity in a structured way in a conscious way in an effective way your tests can then doom you and make you look for sort of the wrong stimuli s t i m u l i so like you may make an assumption about color or shape like you may not recognize that there's concave and convex and then once you test things you could just be making inadequate tests and inadequate observations from there so even something as simple as solving a jigsaw puzzle this isn't the steps that she's using are not trivial and in fact they reflect a lot of what I was trying to do in Enlighten which I'll, I'll do right here. So one thing that was interesting she said it takes a lot of time and practice to uh, be able to visualize right and with Enlighten like I explained last night there's this mode I created called blind mode and when you blind puzzles like this it's encouraging you to visualize uh, in different ways. Uh, so back to my whiteboard you can probably see it but the name of the puzzle is still here it's very faint but it's it's still there it's a good piece of feedback you can't use any of these tools and as soon as you click on the puzzle your feedback goes away right and you're like well how am I supposed to solve it well you're not completely in the dark you know that puzzle was symmetrical and because I clicked here if I wanted to make a symmetrical solution I should click here and if you can kind of see what that would turn into it's great but if not the the names still up there right and you can you can see oh it's radical and if you remember what radical is by the names or you you made up your own name or whatever that should help you visualize radical can only be here these things are lit up and I can see that in my head right because I'm relying on my own knowledge and my own strong memories that I've forged uh, from radical I can go into butterfly just by clicking this or I could have gone into defibrillator by clicking that wait the defibrillator right and um, and if I make a mistake I'm not lost right and I can just solve the puzzle and then it shows me what I did and this challenge in itself is supposed to help players visualize I made a couple of other challenges like the daily challenge here which one uh, convert what well, that one helps visualize creating patterns from scratch helps you visualize right uh, making these shapes oops like that that helps you visualize um, this one's converted into a familiar pattern you're supposed to see the shape here and you know whatever rotation or configuration it is in two clicks uh, oh, I'll get these marks off the screen yeah here you see that puzzle and in two clicks you're supposed to unveil that inside of this light pattern so like it helps you carve out exactly what you're looking for within the the chaos right and you're supposed to uncover it with uh, a little bit of heuristical knowledge a little bit of uh, visualization a little bit of all of it right uh, these are highly challenging skills this one's where you convert the shape into this shape without making a simple shape in between so I know that like that I can visualize it and map my own progress to the solution 
sometimes they're easy and you can do stuff like that. Sometimes you want to cut through the ones you're already going to do. Like this one, I can't cut through, so. Like that. Um, all these daily challenges are helping you basically achieve what I call mastery, right? And I'm, my mastery is 100%, but you know, yours would be much smaller percent and these individual points would reflect your your individual progress but it's the same thing right these steps whether you're so like whether you're learning something simple whether you're doing a simple activity or whether you're doing something that people think is deep and hard you still should be applying your mind uh using you know its full capacity because if you understand how inefficient and how troublesome and tricky and hard it is to sort of lazily go about your learning and, and do bad habits and how hard it is to shake bad habits you probably would never want to make bad habits consciously anyway so if you really do understand that you really should know that you shouldn't take any learning situation or whatever uh lazily right you should apply your mind all the time and that's kind of what i'm stressing here so let me just wipe this whiteboard and we can go back Boop. So she does more puzzles. Oh no, an advertisement. That guy's angry. Because he couldn't achieve mastery and enlightenment. I understand. So she says here that normally she would play without looking at the picture, but because she's making a video of her entire process, she didn't want it to last too long or longer than it needed to. So then she's using the picture to help her position things and, and make relative decisions like that. Um, then again, she, she picks pieces out of the box that are all orange, and it's much easier to do when all of them are face up, right? She just kind of shifts the pieces around and, and doesn't worry too much about um, not getting all the pieces. And she keeps going like that, breaking down the big picture down to smaller manageable groups. And then when she's done with all the blues, she talks about organizing them by um, how many holes they have, which side the little pegs are on, and whatever. That's like a basic sort. Oops, what is she? She's, she's threw in an advertisement in there. I had no idea. And then, you know, she talked about the wrong way to try to match things up. And look, look at how organized her last pieces are. So she can look at the hole, break it down, identify what she needs, and then look at her sort, and then find the best fit. That is so like the sorting algorithm we looked at, right? Um, so like stuff like this so that should kind of um give you some interesting things to think about when in terms of how all these things fit together like this sort right here is a lot more analogous i think to what she did than the other sorts look at this one it's called the it's called what is it called quick sort so like she did a quick sort in the box for all the edge pieces all the yeah, first all the edge pieces. So that's what this is. Edge pieces versus not edge pieces. Then she goes into edge pieces, makes a subsection for just um, corner pieces, right? So if you'll indulge my metaphor, this corner pieces, these are edge pieces, and these are all the other pieces in the, in the box, right? And then you can see how quickly she can handle each individual section, or the algorithm handles each individual section like that. Oh, 100% complete. For the final product, the final sort you're looking for, so far, this section is 100% complete. This section is kind of there, kind of there, and this section is just completely sort of like the rest, right? Not as organized as the other sections. Um, that's exactly how she was approaching it. Uh, building small amounts of order based on known quantities that she assesses through initial sorting, simple sort observations. Like, it's pretty advanced stuff. So don't tell me, I don't want to hear anything about brute forcing anything, right? Like we always know that there's a lazier, worse, less productive, less effective way to do things in life. And if somebody brings up brute forcing every single time that other people are trying to get you to think harder and think better and think smarter, then you're just going to live a very low skill floor life. You're going to just be scrubbing that floor and sweeping it for the rest of your life. So, you know, drawing more metaphors, this is kind of like when she was using the blue pieces on the end game. This is the very final steps, which is easier uh, because of how she's organized everything else. That's just a really handy dandy metaphor. So, um, I got a jigsaw puzzle here. 
we're gonna try to just extract some of those methods and just do it live but in a second right there's one more puzzle article I want to touch on and one other puzzle concept so where is the topic okay so let's talk about the first lesson in meta rationality I know <laughs> this stream seems to be going all over the place but this is exactly kind of um, how I pull together some of my more coherent succinct um, conclusions about game design and about learning I pull from so many different resources simultaneously because that's just how I do it's kind of like one of those sorting algorithms right mm. so this is meta rationality um, where's the good quotes this is called a Bongard problem and I will suggest that Bongard problems are a particularly simple example of meta systemic systematic cognition or meta rationality so here's a, here's the problem right here in front of your face the group uh, I'll just read it the problem above is pretty easy oops so you start with this problem the context of the six boxes on the left all have something in common the six on the right also have something in common which uh, and the thing that the things on the right have in common are the opposite of the things on the left so what is it um, if you're watching on YouTube, you can pause it now. If you're watching on the stream, um, you probably already saw this one because we passed this article around. But um, this is the easiest example you could probably come up with. And you can probably see the pattern. What all these, let me do the whiteboard. What all these have in common versus all of these, right? You probably can see. Uh, and if not, I'll just go ahead and spoil that for you. These are straight lines and these are curvy lines <laughs> on the right side. Um, these shapes are entirely composed of curvy or straight lines. Okay, so how he describes this process is pretty interesting. Bongard problem puts work inside out for most puzzles. In a typical puzzle format, you are given a system of rules, a specific case, and you have to figure out how to apply the rules to that case. Um, for example, that's more like a puzzle, jigsaw puzzle, or Sudoku. The goal is to fill up a 9x9 grid uh, with digits, each column in a row, and three by three box subgrid contains digits one through nine so you gotta figure out how to place those numbers in so that that rule is maintained um, in these bond guard problems you have to figure out what the rule is you are given 12 specific images and the result of applying the rule to each the rule assigns an image either to the left or the right group once you have discovered the rule applying it to the new image would be trivial right so a lot of people talk about puzzle games and how once you solve them once um, it's kind of trivial to solve them again well that's kind of what this puzzle group this type of puzzle falls into that spoiler prone uh, style of puzzle not that big of a deal we can talk about that later but the rule of the first problem uh, yeah straight lines versus curves or whatever and there's more rules what makes Bongar problem interesting is and in some cases very difficult is there are no explicit limitations to what sort of rules there may be right you just look at some shapes you're like what could it possibly be it could be so many things and you gotta however in a well-formed bongard problem there should be only one reasonable rule and you go ah why didn't i see it before aha moment the joy of understanding yay so you solve a Sudoku problem and you work within the rules. This is the essence of systematic thinking or formal rationality. To solve a Bongar problem, uh, this makes you discover the rule. So he's making a distinction between solving and discovering. Uh, this makes for a minimum toy petri dish version of metasystemic systemat systematicity. <laughs> so we're focused here on cognition, evaluating, choosing combines are choosing combines modifies discovers or creating systems rather than working within one so let's just highlight that real quick and I'm gonna bring up even more stuff I'll just do it here hey the picture that I use all the time oh, right click open image and new tab Okay, well, that's good enough for you guys. So, back to the... Here. Evaluating. Let's, let's find it. Uh, do the whiteboard. Where is evaluating? Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-
uh, develop, author, investigate. This is kind of like discovery, right? Uh, modify, appraise, argue, defend, judge, select. Select is like choose. Uh, support, value, critique, way. Uh, differentiate. What do you say? <coughs> oh, my mic wasn't even on in the Discord. No, <laughs> they weren't listening. Um, let's see. Combines, modifies, discovers. Or create systems, so construct, differentiate. What would modify be? Um, solve, demonstrate, interpret. Well, in general, it seems like how we described uh, Sudoku, which is you work within a system rules, the essence of systematic thinking. Um, and you're kind of doing a lot of what he might consider to be applying, right? Which is, yeah, right here, applying, uh, executing on the strategies, uh, solving, right? The word solve comes up in puzzles a lot. Um, yeah, so it looks like if this is Sudoku, this stuff, this upper tier blooms is Bongard. If I can write with my mouse. Uh, let's go back and let's, let's do that so you can read. Okay, so most of the scribes ways of thinking metasystemically. So finding a good formula for a problem is often the most of the work of solving it. That's funny. Uh, Bongard problems take this principle to an extreme. Each problem is simply to figure out what it is. Many of the heuristics are about how to take an unstructured, vague problem domain and get it into a point where formal methods become applicable. The essence of a Bongard problem solution is similar. You need to find a formal structure that makes sense to the data. The difference is that Bongard problems are much less vague than real world, typically ones, uh, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, building a model. I, like I demonstrated before, Enlighten, it's kind of like with this um, sorter that I gave you. It's kind of like a Bungar problem, uh, but whenever you make your groups like this, let's see, the Imagine Engine versus uh, Flow Point, right? If, if you just saw this group of puzzles and this group of puzzles, could you imagine that this one f fits in this category? However, it's defined in this one fits in this one. There's no overlap. How many different groups can you select where there's absolutely no overlap but tons of examples? Let's try Chase. Chase and Float Point apparently have no overlap so far, at least. Uh, let's try Bring Together. Oh, these middles have overlap. So again, uh, taking a large set of data, trying to find these these patterns and apply it to it and figure out how sort of clean and robust those connections and rules are. That's upper level mental stuff, people. Uh, any situation can be described in infinitely many ways. Choosing a vocabulary at the right level of description for describing relative, relevant factors is key to understanding. This is exactly what we talked about with, um, and demonstrated with the jigsaw puzzle. Um, we're looking to describe things but in describing things, we need vocabulary, which are distinct, uh, conceptually defined um, concepts. <laughs> they're, just, they're concepts that are defined by separate groups, div divisive groups that separate things from one side to the other. Uh, that makes it super sharp and, and, and effective in your mind as far as forming neural pathways and building up so many other mental structures that are super important for learning. So like finding the right vocabulary based on observations or descriptions at the right level of description for describing relevant factors is the key. So you got to look at the things that are important and make descriptions that are, uh, are at the right level, not just like uh, to go back to the jigsaw puzzle. Not just like, uh, oh, this piece is light blue. This piece is also kind of blue. I'll draw the screen. It doesn't do any good if you're like, this is, this, no, this piece is blue and this piece is blue and this is blue and this is, they're all blue. This, this whole section is blue. Like that doesn't do you any good. Some are dark blue, some are light blue. Um, some of the light blue here 
it's comparable to the light blue here. Some of these pieces here have a slightly darker, perhaps, blue than some of the essence inside of this this particular paper crane. So to be able to intelligently know, like, I'm sorting cranes and those colors are different than the light blue background, so on and so forth, like, making even simple, meaningful distinctions like that helps you build the better sorting methods and be make better observations on top of that. So, relevant factors, right level description, and vocabulary. You gotta separate things in the group. Uh, when we're talking conceptually, we use the word vocabulary because language is pretty abstract and it just points to things, but when talking about something concrete like a jigsaw, physically arranging the pieces. Um, quotes GEB from Hofstadter, a uh, book I was reading, Golo Escher Bach and an Internal Golden Braid. I quoted a lot of this in my blog, just like this guy's quoting in his blog, so... <laughs> You start by recognizing simple figures such as triangles and squares, or a successful problem formulation has to make explicit the distinctions that are used in the problem solution. Okay. You start by recognizing simple figures such as triangles and squares, and you start building up descriptions in terms of properties and relationships. Some of the figures are big, some are small, some point up, some point down, some are inside others, some touch others, some are right over the others. Just like the puzzle, jigsaw puzzle pieces, right? Um, some are, oops, some jigsaw pieces have inside pieces, and some have pokey out pieces, and some are convex, or concave, and some are convex, right, with little bumpies. It's a terrible drawing, but that's exactly the kinds of things you need to observe from these simple observations. And some figures and circles only touch triangles and inside of big things, and then you build on top of that. A uh, successful formulation has to abstract the problem to eliminate irrelevant details and make it small enough that it's easy to solve, and stuff like that. So he goes on and on, but a lot of this thinking is in the same wheelhouse. We're all thinking about... Um, how we learn, how we apply our mind, how we use observations, and how we build bigger structures while doing so. So in the DO chat, after thinking about these things, I'm like, wouldn't it be cool if we redesigned jigsaw puzzles? So what Enlighten does is it took my particular learning method and experience for digging deep into puzzle games, and I tried to make explicit tools and feedback for other people to sort of see how I do it, feel the same things that I feel, hopefully, and, and get the similar or same results. Uh, you could do the same thing for jigsaw puzzles. Apparently, having this method helps so that people just don't put a whole bunch of pieces on the ground, try to match a few, get frustrated, and stop. Methods help. Like That's how you cut down on complexity. It's how you use your high-level brain. It's not fun to be forced to use lower-level brain stuff that t to a task that's pretty much impossible for it to, to take. It's much better to teach people the higher level stuff, and that's that's how we enjoy these things and why we enjoy these things. So maybe you could design a jigsaw puzzle um, uh, differently. And some of the ideas that I had was like, oh, what if the edges of the puzzles weren't just swoopy shapes, but like very specific shapes that are help you to key in on specific details? Like, what if a shape was like pointy? Some of them were pointy. Then you know you have puzzle pieces like this, and then other pieces in the same box are loopy, right? Loopy. And like, what if you had a variety of shapes? What if some are like boxy? And that would just help you sort. It gives you like a real distinct way of seeing the pieces and their sorts. While experienced puzzle people may know the difference between that shape, that shape, this shape, and like this shape. Like those are all maybe different to them. But since they already have that eye developed, doing stuff like this with the more distinct shapes would help newer players have the same or similar kind of experience as they do. Um, that's kind of the stuff I'm thinking about. It'd be cool if you use uh, alternate reality and you hold your camera up to puzzle shapes. It could either, you know, display the colors on the, the puzzle pieces in a different way to help you form groups. It can, um, you know, where's Waldo style. Oh, I gotta show you this. Oh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Here it is. Let's see if I can pull this up for you guys. I mean, computers are pretty cool, and we understand them pretty well, especially for doing low-level stuff like this, but check this out. AI has peaked. Hopefully you guys can see that. Oops. Uh, let me just make this big. 
you probably already get the, the idea. AI has speech, so it has a hand, and it has a camera, and this is what the AI sees. Just like Facebook, or those Chinese traffic cams. Finds Wallow instantly, slaps Wallow in the face, saying, why were you hiding from me? Did it in a matter of seconds, right? So we can use computers in powerful ways uh, to help to help solve problems that we have, but the, I think the more interesting and more important thing is finding ways f to build systems that work naturally with our normal ways that our brain works, augments them, and more importantly, maybe shields us from some of the bad habits that we have. Uh, can help us stay mentally focused and emotionally in line and line up our expectations and help us take breaks when we need to take breaks and give us feedback on the stuff that we're pretty much clueless about and do too much by feel and we wing it too much. It's just so pathetic how, how sort of blinded in the dark we are about learning. That's why I work so hard on, on Enlighten and that's also why I like the light theme for Enlighten because Enlightenment and, sh and shedding light on things is just whatever. Douglas. Oh, bop, 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 bop. So back to the Discord. So I just was brainstorming some ideas for um, alternate reality and how that could change the way people understand how jigsaws work. Um, and then the conversation went on from there, but that's why you have to join the Discord if you want to be a part of it. I'm not going to rehash all that. So back to presidential power. Ignore that. So, in closing, I could probably go over this and just see if any of that. What? What is? What is this? I like blue. Reset. Choose a number of puzzle pieces. Okay, that's crazy. It can take an image and split it up like that. So let's just stick with the default. And we, can we move them anywhere we want? We can. All right. Let's get to sorting. That'd be kind of cool doing this communally. Can I rotate these? Wow, if you can't rotate them, then the number of possible combinations drops significantly. Get out of here, you advertisement. Hmm, nice satisfying click. And then you can't ever undo them. That's kind of funny, too. Uh, let's keep going. Let's get all these end pieces. And now that I've filtered for these, this wood color right here, I'm just scanning the board very quickly for this pattern. And kind of... Don't tell me that's a match. No. Yeah, but if you're watching this, this would be a great time for someone to chime in or pipe up. But if you're not here, you can't do that. So you can just deal with it. I don't It's YouTube or whatever. It's, you're in complete control. <laughs> I guess, you know, I can already line these up in the top and bottom since I can't rotate them and I already know this is a quarter piece and I already know this is a left piece. Uh, probably. And I already know this is the top piece. This is another bottom piece. It probably goes along with one of these. Not that one though. We'll figure that out later. This is a side piece. Each of side side day. Here to go to Mono Woko Meadow Rhapsody. Appreciation, Woko Mochi no Toto, K, Honto, Arigato. Puzzles. What's up, Matt? <laughs> I'm wrapping up my stream here. Saw that. It's pretty cool. Puzzles, sorting. Yeah, something that I did not know was as interesting or significant until putting some thoughts together and then, uh, of course, yelling at Zara. <laughs> that's that's how I. All the good conversations. Each more side side day. Hiro mo hiro wo hiro goro mo wo komero rap sorry. Appreciation wo komochi no do do ke honto rawi arigato honto arigato datto e bok 
Boko, Doko, Doki, Doc, Day, Community, Sun, Sun, Ni, Kanshita, Studio. I need to apply a lot of this new revelation to me finally learning freaking Japanese. But at least I understand. Oh, that's cool. What have you, what have you been using? Duolingo. Duolingo? Yeah. Yeah, I noticed some... <laughs> curious patterns. No, no problems. Noise is fine. I'm just solving a jigsaw. Yeah, I can play some Splatoon after. Yeah. This much hotel more. level is kind of cool, but people are stupid. <laughs> I'm like, why are you going this way? Oh, uh, what's this it called? What's way. what's it called? Arrow something. I don't know. Abac Albacore. Albacore. That's not he to welcome in, welcome in. That's rhapsody. Appreciation, welcome, what you know, though, though, okay. Honto, I got Try sloshing. Oh, that was a good video. I don't know if I hit a wall or anything in, uh, in line, but I just, I just have to. I'll check out your stats. They are, hard, they are more difficult now. Let me, let me check out your stats. Uh, I don't know. The water. Not that great. I don't want to put that on stream so everyone can get the password. <laughs> How dare they? It doesn't matter. Or does it? It actually does matter. Hmm. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, I think. Do I want to edit that out? That's fine. Matt. And Matt is just Matt, not Matthew. Okay. Just copy that over. You're going home? <laughs> yeah. They're like staring at it. Come on. I gotta go hunting for avocados later today. Avocado? You need a lawyer? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so Matt's color is red. It's about up four hours. His uh, puzzle solve line starts to taper off like some kind of logarithmic uh, graph. That nice, that nice curve there. Um, and then the perfected. You've perfected all the ones you've done, or almost. Yeah. I know. And then uh, nothing blind. And you've solved roughly fifty-two. Uh, any dailies? No dailies. Okay. I don't think I've unlocked the daily challenge. I don't oh, know. Uh, it might just be a a few more lectures down. Okay. So you don't use the click keeper a lot? Or oh, wait, that's the Overwatch tool. You don't use the relevant notes. You don't use the hidden shapes. You don't use the click keeper. So you don't use the tools. <laughs> I don't know how. I use the one, I like the one that like shows you which puzzles are relevant to the one that you saw. The, which notes are? Or, or what do you mean? Uh, like the one that connects, it connects to the simpler puzzles. Oh yeah, that's, that's uh, that automatic. Is. So let's see, um, let's see. So your enlightenment level is at 26% it looks like, and your mastery level is at 10? <laughs> um, so let's look at how many notes you've written, because it's just curious. Probably like three. Yep, somewhere around six. Uh, and then shapes are renamed. You've renamed some. Yeah. <laughs> More than me. Um, completed conversations. You've listened to Richard a little bit there. Something like that. 
Okay. So, essentially, this is your data shows sort of exactly um, what's difficult or what the limitation is for just taking like a, a keep it all in your head general approach to solving these things. And um, even though it's not easy to understand, trying to figure out like, well, why is taking notes going to help me with some of these hard ones? So like, it's actually all feeding this process. And the reason why a lot of people um, underestimate things, the smaller steps, is because they all work together instead of like, you know, doing one small step and getting this immediate clear feedback and payoff and therefore people can justify doing something they quote unquote don't want to do. Um, <laughs> but essentially, essentially there's a lot of uh, tools there for you to use to explore, like um, you, you probably unlock these tools on the bottom left, at least one of them. Uh, let me see what your, oops, what your uh, lecture answers are. So let's say you go to lecture three, about... so, be quiet Richard. So yeah, you, you you answered the question in lecture three. That's cool. So lecture four. Learning is. Be quiet, Richard. You answered that one. So okay, let's go to six. If you unlock notes, you probably got now to the we seven. Must consider the... Yep. Yeah. I don't really make solution notes, says Matt. <laughs> oh, that may that may be that may be part of it. I don't know. So what's interesting is. I don't know what people will be able to do or not with whatever tools or not. Uh, maybe somebody out there can master it without taking a single note. Don't know. Um, but regardless of that, however you learn and whatever you do will be represented in your stats. And when you start to taper off with your success or hit walls and kind of not know where they came from, the answer is always that, you know, I think on one of the lectures I, I mentioned this, like this idea of hitting a mental brick wall. Uh, you hit a wall because you created the wall yourself. <laughs> Not that there was some wall existing out there in the world and you finally ran up against it. The wall is rather made from a lot of your smaller decisions, your less efficient, less um, forward thinking, less uh, effective decisions that sort of their, their negatives add up to make this wall that it's a big negative, right? Um, and once you get to that point, it's kind of hard to know how you got there. Be quiet, Richard. <laughs> Matt, I don't take notes. <laughs> well, so you have your answer, Matt. <laughs> um, and most likely this, this, this same level of uh, the same wall that you experience or the same tapering off of success and will be evident in any activity where you, you don't take notes instead of just like just this puzzle game, it's just probably a general uh, result. Like you'll get X far until you do these Y steps, no matter how the activity is. And maybe some things you have more aptitude for, like martial arts and things like that. Maybe some you'll have less for, like like basket weaving, classic American pastime. <laughs> Mr. Lacewell used to always use that as his uh, example. When he talked about water basket weaving or basket weaving? just basket weaving, when he talked about like don't diss and underestimate other people's hobbies, like we do music, but other people put a lot of energy into things like, and he always said basket weaving, and it's like they if you go hard enough hardcore, and it's gonna be hard, and you'll distinguish yourself uh, one way or another. The ping pong prince. Now it's time for us to continue. consider memory. Oh, so Matt didn't do lecture 10. Well, if nothing else, when, when you play Matt, just listen to a few more lectures, answer a few more questions. Because um, the next one, the next lecture is about memory and, and how your memory works and how that might be relevant to the things and the problems that you're facing. Um, but yeah. Travis was did a s very similar thing too. He didn't take notes. He didn't want to. He didn't understand why they were useful. wasn't in the habit, whatever reason. And then I was like, you should take notes. <laughs> like it's just all I can say is you should take notes because they work. And it's not just that they work because they're something written on a piece of paper. They work because it's something that changed the way you thought when you were making it. 
Uh, he started taking notes and he had a breakthrough. And then I was like, you should add shapes. He's like, why would I ever add shapes? I'm like, okay. And he started adding shapes and he had a breakthrough. I'm like, oh, that's... <laughs> don't don't tell me. <laughs> so yeah, whatever you end up doing, just let me know. We'll, we'll catch up to your results in the future. And I'm, I'm going to do a few more of these jigsaw clicks and then close the stream. This is welcome, Frank. <laughs> welcome, Frank, yes. That's uh, that's my uh, fake name I put. I don't know why I put it. I was just tired of making up like Kirby Kid 2 and Richard Account 3 when I kept making more and more accounts and the last one I was like, Frick. And it stuck. I can rename it, but no. Time to rename the shape, Frick. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I need to identify a lot of my edge, I need to do a better job of sorting basically like edge piece and I need to stop lollygagging at bottom piece. Yeah, so even though I had the method in mind, I didn't actually do it that effectively, right? I was a little lazy on a few of these steps, but now it's coming together. I think that's one thing a lot of other uh, a lot of people commonly underestimate as well. When you communicate a method to them, because methods are designed to be little bite-sized tips, they sound easy. And even if you can imagine yourself applying it, like, oh yeah, just collect all the edge pieces, simple. It's doing it is still very different. It's not easy. None of this is trivial. It's so deceptively tricky to think you have it and then like. You, you're out of practice, so you're not in the nut. This one actually goes right here. Yeah, like the point is to, you get so much benefits from doing the low level um, interactions with focus that you don't realize that's no, like. Even, I mean, they even emphasize that kind of stuff in martial arts. Mm -hmm. You gotta learn how to punch before you can. Yeah, a lot of this stuff comes naturally to people who play sports because they're just like the metaphor of you got to train your body and it's not just about your mind. People are like, oh, okay, makes sense, but it's all because of your mind. Period. Like, <laughs> sure, you you, you want to stretch and be limber, but it all comes from your mind in the first place. It's not just because you know martial arts is body and mind because you're kicking people. It's because your mind has these limitations and quirks to begin with, and moving your body is a way to reinforce what you're putting into your mind just like physically moving these little um jigsaw pieces is a way to reinforce the sorting that should be going on in your mind Yeah, and there's, there's definitely a way to sort of overwhelm yourself when you're doing any activity but like solving these puzzles. Like if you glance around haphazardly, you're probably going to be like, Bleh. throw up. Once the next shift in the playlist, I think it's in nine minutes, so that's a good time to try to beat this. Any more edge pieces? I know there's at least one. Here we go. Here you go. This one goes right here. I need to get a See, these, I keep looking at these to see if they're edge pieces. That's because I did not remove them from my consideration, and now they're just bothering me, so they can go home. These are not what I'm looking for. So now I'm going to look in the opposite direction. Yeah. You were hiding the whole time. Who was I? The edge piece. Nothing about Splatoon. Oh, you more than you bargain for, yeah. Oh, 
right, there's one more SP, so where have I not looked? Up right here. Let's see, now I'm using my brain differently. Because I have the organizing structure, instead of just scanning back over them and hoping that the piece pops out, I'm like, I remember moving my, I'll show you guys on the whiteboard. I, um, oop, I remember moving my eyes over here. Didn't find it, so stop moving my eyes over here. This is already organized, so I stopped. And the places I hadn't looked were here, so I identified the piece here very quickly, and then I just went here, and I was like, looked over here, and, and identified it. You can, if you don't keep track of what you do, and if you move faster than you can think, and you're not organized, you're bound to just live a sort of scrape the bottom brute force kind of approach there. Okay, so now we can just organize things by color. So like anything with a Roman numeral or a swirly face, let's just put over here, 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 Roman numeral, swirly face, Roman numeral, swirly face. And everything might have a swirly face, but at least we're getting the Roman numerals. I'm not worrying about the strictness of my sorting criteria, right? I'm just doing this first, Roman numeral, it's a big Roman numeral. Oh, this is 11. If it's an 11, it's probably right here. See, now I'm going to visualize that piece. Ah, brass. And if the 11's here, 4 o'clock's here, right? Found it. See, like now, I've already, I'm starting to look for the upper level pattern, which I didn't do before because I kept distracting myself. Um, maybe this. Maybe this. Ah, uh, there's one more clock I'm not accounting for, so it must be right here. And this one must go here. And this one must go cats in America, where the streets are filled with cheese. So we go to cats in America. Set your mind at ease. Never! My true love lies. But, but there are no cats in America. But there are no cats in America. And these have the smaller Roman numerals with the brass tacks. Hey, put cheese. Streets are nacho. paved with nacho cheese. <laughs> so now, what am I looking for when I scan? Yeah. Leather. Yeah. Leather. Leather. Bottom brass. Bottom brass. Top right. Gotta fight. Gold center. Maybe here. Sp spinning top. You know where it's at. Which numeral is this? Uno? Nope. Here. So I need to look for the black brass numbers. Yeah, now my pieces are on top of each other. Not the best situation to be in. Nope. Yeah. 
It'd be cool if you could just move this whole big piece and click it into place for all the little pieces, but I'm not at that level. <laughs> Ah, my eyes subdivided that one. I was like, mmm. Where could this go? Probably right here. Now I need to find some other gray ashened piece. There we go. And probably right here. Here's 11. Right there. Stop. Some kind of weird 2. Okay. Some kind of weird 12 goes with the 11. And that goes right here. Let's get out of here. Do I need a piece that's vertical with the two holes in it. So now I'm going to use finally the piece uh, right here. Yep. I used that scan just like they taught me and I did it. Yep, yep, yep. Anything that looks peach or a hot, hot pink looking right here. Yep. Anything that's gold looking. Yep. Anything that's hot peach looking right here? Yep. Nope. Right there. So now I got that piece that I was wondering how it fit. Where are those pink innards? Oh, this is the leather piece. I wonder if you could solve this jigsaw puzzle blind, where the further deeply you go into it, the more it, it takes away your sight. You're like, you should remember the thing you were working on. Like, if you organize properly, you should remember roughly. Chicago, Illinois, 60652. Or maybe like every time you click a piece, you're supposed to t tell like an AI like what general direction to put it. And if it can't figure it out, you're like, you didn't, you didn't have it in your head, brah. What can I say? Brah. It's red, so it's gotta be somewhere around here, right? Yep. Ooh. Right here. Here? Yeah. Right here. Right here. The innards. Yep. Um top rightish. Yep. This one's a little fancier. Yep. Bottom rightish. That's left. Here's the number one. There's only so many places I can go. Okay, don't know where that piece goes. We can just leave him. Ah, the, the hidden six. What looks like it's just in the middle of a clock. Where? Now this is the top of a clock. There was these Wind Waker sliding panel puzzles that they had of increasing difficulty. I like solving those a lot. There was also a mini game in Pokemon XY where they take the living sort of models of your Pokemon and do a live scramble picture. I thought that was neat as well. A lot of the modes in Enlightened were also inspired by watching the Rubik's Cube documentary. So it's like, oh, look what they can do with their eyes closed and all this cool fancy stuff. Like, I would like to be able to do that. I was like, but I have to work up to it. And like, I'll put the skills in so that everyone can work up to it. Where does this one go?
Now I gotta look at the shapes a little better. Yeah, you're using the image to, re to rely on too much when you have much simpler categories narrowed down. That's kind of interesting. Hey, I didn't know I had an audience. That's more people down there than in my Twitch stream. All right, that's it for today's stream. We went over a lot of topics. Join us in the Discord if you want to continue talking about them. But until next time, guys, see you later.